Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 22nd, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on the show each Tuesday morning from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, early in the session, both the House and Senate scolded the Dunleavy administration for not doing its homework. Now, they're doing the very same thing. Second, the long-awaited Buckeye Institute report, which the administration touted in its 10-year plan, is out, but it hugely disappoints. And third, on the federal side, the annual Social Security report is out, and it's frightening. And now, let's join Michael. Here We have got a, a huge... Um, a huge amount of hypocrisy going on. Uh, all we heard during the session, especially the early days, as they tried to grab, you know, wrap their minds around the budgets and everything, is that their biggest disappointment is that the governor hadn't analyzed every aspect of the budget to see what the impact would be on this and that and the other thing. And then when it was all said and done, they themselves went ahead and made decisions without ever coming up and putting economic justification for what those impacts would be either. Yeah, exactly right. I, we we all recall day after day after day early in the session when uh, the OMB director, Donna Arduin, uh, was in front of both the House committees and in the House Finance Committee and the Senate Finance Committee and just being grilled and drilled about uh, the failure of the administration to, to understand all the impacts and to be able to articulate all of the impacts on Alaskans of of the uh, of their various spending cuts, what's going to happen, you know, to seniors as a result of the cuts in senior benefits? What's going to happen to uh, 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 criminals as a result of the cuts in the uh, public safety? What's going to happen to, you know, this, that, and the other thing? And 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 every day that she was doing those presentations was just another opportunity for uh, House Finance and Senate Finance and people like Natasha von Inhoff to to you know grill her about why did why did you fail to look into the impacts of uh, of of these cuts now fast forward to the senate fi to the house finance committee a couple of weeks ago and to the senate finance committee uh, uh, this week uh, as they anal as they as they take up how they're going to finance uh, their budget and implicitly doing pfd cuts neither one of them will admit that's what they're doing but but implicitly financing the budget on the back of pfd cuts and they, they're doing no analysis, no analysis, uh, no discussion of the impact on Alaskans, the very thing they ask the OMB director about, no impact of the anal uh, no, no analysis of the impact on Alaskans uh, of PFD cuts. Right. Um, not calling ICER, uh, not calling economists uh, uh, like they did uh, early on with uh, with the uh, impact on uh, on Alaska of of the spending cuts, not doing any of that, just leaping immediately into PFD cuts, and and the funny thing is, uh, the sad thing is, that the analysis is already out there. ICER's already done it. They did it in 2016 at the same time they were doing the analysis that that the committees highlighted early in the session about what would happen as a result of spending cuts. In that very same study, in that very same 2016 study, ICER did an analysis of the impact of PFD cuts uh, and compared them to other revenue options. Uh, and so the, the analysis is out there, but as as both the Finance Committee on the House side and the, and the and on the Senate side, you know, pr go down this road of PFD cuts, they don't want to hear it. They're they're not right. they're not they're not calling back those same witnesses. 
that they did the first time when they wanted to talk about spending cuts. They're not calling back those witnesses uh, to talk about PFD cuts. Right. Well, and that is the the irony of this whole situation is they go there and they start lamenting about these. And all you heard about was, my God, they're going to cut 5,000 jobs out of the economy if they put these cuts through and yada, yada, yada. And yet in this same report... It talks specifically about the employment loss of what happened with things like a PFD cut or a sales tax or an income tax and everything else. And none of those numbers were ever brought up. No, no. And and ICER, I mean, the ICER conclusions are clear. In the 2016 report, ICER said this, the impact of the PFD cut falls almost exclusively on residents, which means none of it falls on, on non-resident workers in the state. And it is highly regressive. So it has the largest, largest adverse impact on the economy per dollar of revenue raised. PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the economy of all the various new revenue options. In a, in a follow-on report in February of 2017, uh, ICER said a cut in PFDs would be by far the costliest measure for, for Alaska families, would have by far the largest impact adverse impact on Alaska families. In another study in 2017, ICER said that reducing the PFD by just $1,000, and we're well over that, reducing the PFD by $1,000 will likely increase the number of Alaskans below the poverty line by 12 to 15,000 Alaskans. 2% of the Alaska population would likely fall below the poverty line as a result of a $1,000, just a $1,000 cut. Um, in the PFD. So all of the analysis that the, of, of what the impact uh, on Alaskans is of cutting the PFD uh, is, is all out there. It's all available. It's, it's available in the very same reports that the, that the House and the Senate highlighted uh, during the beginning part of the session when they wanted to talk about spending cuts. It's all out there, but the House and the Senate are just ignoring it. They're doing the very same thing that they accuse the administration of doing of not analyzing the impact of their actions uh, as they as they as they go through the process of deciding how they're going to finance the deficit they're creating. Well, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, uh, talking about the weekly top three. I don't know why we're surprised, Brad. This is typical business as usual. This is the hypocrisy that we've seen in this and past legislator, uh, uh, you know, legislatures where they basically, it's a do as I say, not as I do. You should provide all the analysis, but we're going to make the decisions based on what we think is best. And, of course, what we think is best is burning through, you know, $14 billion in four years, plus 15% a year increases in runaway spending the previous six years before that. I mean, it's, this is, you know, this is just business as usual in the Capitol. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not surprising, I suppose, but it's hugely disappointing. I mean, you want you want your government to be fair, to be considering all the impacts, to be considering the options. <clears throat> I mean, with a nine with a one point three billion dollar um, uh, 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 PFD cut, which is what uh, when you sort of go through what the House and the Senate are, are talking about ex- about where they land up. With a $1.3 billion PFD cut, we're talking about taking not over 9,000 jobs, using the ICER analysis, over 9,000 jobs out of the economy. Now, there are, other, there are other revenue options to close that. I mean, what they're not considering are other revenue options. And yes, those other revenue options have impacts also, but none are as high, none have as high an adverse impact, none produce as large a job loss uh, on the overall economy uh, as PFD cuts, and none produce as large an inc- income impact, income loss uh, to to the Alaska economy as PFD cuts. And you have heard, we have heard nothing, nothing about that analysis um, uh, in the House and Senate Finance Committees. It's because, you know, looking on the Senate side, you've got Natasha von Imhoff, clearly a top one percenter, clearly looking out for protecting her and her family. And protecting her, you know, top twenty percent donors and 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 friends and family circle. Uh, uh, clearly, the PFD cuts best for her because it only takes about two per well less than less than one percent of her income, about two percent of uh, the the top twenty percent income. 
you, you don't hear that from her because that's the best for her. For, for middle-income Alaska families, it's nine per, you're taking 9% of their income. For low-income Alaska families, you're taking 29% uh, of their income. They just don't want to talk about that. Right. Even though, even though their proposed solution has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, and on Alaska families, they don't want to talk about it. Uh, Harold says in the chat room, there are no taxes better than other taxes. There's a tax is a tax is a tax. Um, I mean, I would disagree with that, but I mean, cause I mean, no taxes are good in my opinion, but there are some that have less impact overall on the overall Alaskan economy. Yep, exactly right. And, and the, and the PFD cut, the PFD, I mean, let's be clear. PFD cuts are a tax, right? Right. They take away income. They divert income that's otherwise going to citizens to government. That's the classic definition of a tax, uh, the diversion of income from individuals, from citizens, over to the government. PFD cuts are a tax, and they have the large and, and they have the largest adverse impact uh, of all of the of all of the potential tax options. And yet, you haven't heard one word of that. Just like just like they accuse the administration of not considering what the impact was going to be of senior benefit cuts on seniors or or all of the other things. You haven't heard one word of that analysis from either House Finance or Senate Finance. It's they, they are hiding the ball from Alaskans. They're hiding the ball from, from, from those who are trying to understand what's the best course forward uh, uh, for the Alaska economy. Uh, and, they're, and they're doing it uh, just to protect themselves, just to protect the top 20% themselves and their, and their donor class. So this is the hypocrisy that we were talking about earlier in the legislature. Uh, look, I don't want to tax at all. I think that we could cut ourselves out of this situation, but it just seems like the legislature is hell-bent on it one way or the other. Uh, and do we want a tax that is essentially a stealth tax in the taking of the PFD? Because that's a, that's a short-term, that's a short-term uh, uh, fix. That's a self-licking ice cream cone because in two or three years at that rate, the PFD will be gone, and they will have to look to other sources, uh, and that's part of the problem. I mean, really, the whole issue here is that we have a, a legislature that lacks the political will to live within its means. Yeah, it's it's more driven. The legislature is more driven by the special interests and by the special pleading of "please spend on me, please spend spend on me," as opposed to what in the interests of the Alaska economy as a whole. You, have, you, have, you don't have to look any farther than the university to figure that out. We have, we have three universities we are spending at more than double the national average, almost triple the national average spending per full-time equivalent student in our three university system. The, the Dunleavy administration proposed cutbacks in that to only 150% of the national average. They didn't propose right. to cut it back to the national average. They certainly didn't propose to cut it back to below the national average. They proposed to cut it back to 150%, $11,000 per full-time equivalent student as, as the funding source for the university. That would be more than enough to fund a good quality single university system. But the special pleading around that of, oh, no, we've got to keep the three-university system because we've got to keep the jobs that go along with the three-university system, um, and, and we've got to keep you know people employed. We can't hurt Juno where, where UAS is or, or Anchorage, the, the small part of the Anchorage economy that's tied to the university. We can't hurt those. Oh, no, we can't withdraw to one university. And, and a legislature who is continuing, I mean, both the House and the Senate, budget proposals continue within within fractions the same sort of funding level per full, full-time equivalent student uh that was there uh when we got into this mess right neither make any significant cuts uh from that sort of level and 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 both the house and the senate are going along with that sort of special pleading well that alone funding the university system at the level they want to uh, as opposed to what Dunleavy proposed, is something like $400 out of your PFD. Everybody's paying a $400 PFD tax in order to continue to fund this three-university system as opposed to going back to a one-year university system. And that $400 would have, it put in the hands of Alaskans, would have a larger impact on the Alaska economy, a better impact on the Alaska economy, than continuing to spend it on the university system. Yet, 
the the legislature, both the House and the Senate Finance Committee, or both well the House and the Senate, the full House and the Senate Finance Committee, are proposing to to continue that level of spending in response to the special pleading that comes from the university and and those associated with it. Insanity. Okay, we are in the break right now. Um, uh, Brad Keithley continues our guest. It's our in between behind the scenes sections, the show behind the show, so to speak. And uh, we take some questions from you, the listeners, here as we get going on through here. And Harold uh, has, uh, I mean, I think this is ne- this is probably um, also kind of relevant. He says the PFD is the largest tax? Question mark. Let's get this straight. Every dollar being spent are dollars from Alaskans' mineral rights. Every dime, the oil revenue, the PFD, the PFD returns, all of it is a tax and essentially he's he's right i mean i've talked about this as pie it's a pie in the sky thing brad but i've talked about this in the past i mean part of the problem here is is that overall the revenue stream and everything else for the state of alaska is really the whole thing is a hidden stealth tax on alaskans because we do own the resources collectively and those resource royalties and those payments and all those monies they i mean they are ours technically and what we should do is receive them all directly and then if the state really wanted to, you know, get its pound of flesh and do it properly, it would then issue us a tax bill for those things. And the problem is we never see that money. So we don't understand how much is being spent on government. I mean, I said, ideally, give each and every one of us our slice of the pie, so to speak. You know, what would that be, Twelve, thirteen thousand dollars $13,000? And then issue us a tax bill. And, of course, when everybody got their tax bill that was ten or eleven thousand dollars per person they'd poop their collective pants and the spending in the government would come to a grinding halt yeah that was i mean that was sort of dick randolph's point at the beginning that 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 he would be fine he would have been fine with an income tax if there would have been a complete distribution of the revenues from the minerals to citizens and then the government had to tax back um he he argued at the time that, that Hammond's approach, the 50-50 approach, was an implicit 50% tax on the PFD or on the on the mineral re- resources uh, uh, from the outset, and there's there there is there is some argument for that, but you know we are where we are. That's uh, that's that's we've 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 been under a 50% um, uh, PFD since the early 1980s, and the question now is as as government has consumed that other 50%, well. It, much more than that, consumed through uh, through production taxes, taking all the production taxes, consumed more than than that share of the mineral wealth. Uh, what's what what are we facing going forward? Um, and and I guess that's that's the ICER analysis. What are we facing going forward? And the analysis is of those proposals that have been made out there, put out there, uh, the PFD cut, further cutting the PFD, further cutting. The uh, the owner's share of the mineral wealth uh, is uh, has the largest adverse impact. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Gary says in the chat room, um, I say put it to a vote of the people. Take part of your PFD or tax your income. Let the voters of the state decide, as that is how these things are supposed to work. That is if the idiots in Juno cannot reduce spending. And uh, I think that's where we're at. If they can't reduce spending, which... Like I said, I think you could have a House full of Republicans and a Senate full of Republicans, and they still would not be able to agree on a reduced spending number. This is where it has to go, but it has to go in front of a vote of the people. I agree with that. You? Sure. Uh, but but <laughs> we elect – I mean, we, we speak with two tongues, right? I mean, we, we elect Governor Dunleavy, who says exactly the same thing, that any PFD – that any change to the PFD uh, statute uh, or any uh, increased taxes – uh, or, or spending beyond a certain level has to go to a vote of the people, it needs to take it to the vote of the people. And, and we elected Governor Dunleavy. But then we, at the same time, we elect legislators uh, like Natasha von Imhoff uh, that go down to Juneau and say, ah, no, we're not doing that. Gary says, I would entertain a capped sales tax. By capped, I would say all purchases up to a max of a $5 tax. This will be for smaller purchases, and we'll not dig into those Alaskans who purchase large items, especially in tourism season. We'll generate revenue from that. We need to protect our own. For one, we make large purchases like appliance, appliances and vehicles. And while it is um, while it is attractive to try and capture a portion of that tourism market, and I don't know if we could do that with a seasonal sales tax or not, but 
Um, I mean, again, it is a more regressive tax because people on the lower end of the spectrum spend a larger proportional uh, a slice of their income on basic necessities and things that they need. And so they would feel it more. Um, I mean, I don't even want to go to a tax. But uh, again, the 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 flat tax versus pretty much all the other taxes uh, is still the most attractive because it hits everybody proportionally on their adjusted gross income. Am I right or wrong? No, you're, you're absolutely right. Sales tax is regressive. Uh, it has a bigger impact on middle and lower income uh, brackets than it does on the upper income bracket. And the other thing about sales tax is it's got a we've got a relatively small sales tax base uh, in the state. And in order to generate the type of in the type of revenue that we need to generate to close these budget gaps, the sales tax would need need to be in the neighborhood unli- and, and and not not focused only on certain items. The sales tax would need to be in the, if, if I recall the calculations I've done correctly, would need to be at, at the level of about 10 to 12 percent um, in order to generate the type of revenue to close these budget gaps. It doesn't, in other words, the, the, the tax base is so small that, that it really doesn't generate a lot of income at low percentages. You really need to have a high percentage. And the final thing about a sales tax is not only is it regressive, it's middle and lower income brackets harder than the upper income bracket. Not only is there a limited tax base, you need to generate a lot of, you need to have a very high percentage, but also sales taxes are the are the revenue base that local governments, a lot of local governments in the state rely on, particularly in the coastal communities, uh, the tourism communities, they already rely on sales taxes. And so imposing a state sales tax on top of a local tax base uh, would would really start to undercut the local tax base just at the same time, just at the same time as as the state government is starting to push funding responsibility, more funding responsibility for schools and other things, down to the local tax base. So it would it would it would adversely impact uh, local governments just at the time that they're getting more responsibility for it. Um, sales taxes, you know, some some states rely on sales taxes, but they have much larger tax base. And their local governments tend to rely more on property tax, uh, and so there's not they're not undercutting the local uh, governments. It's uh, Al- Alaska is different in that regard. We just don't have a large enough tax base. I would say that uh, that a flat tax does sort of does the same thing. A flat tax would reach non-resident workers in the state. Uh, their uh, income derived in the state would be subject to the flat tax in the same way that uh, non-residents, and that's about a seven or a ten percent um, uplift uh, in revenue. That is, we only need to recover, we only need a set of tax that recovers ninety percent uh, from uh, from Alaskans because the remaining ten percent of revenue would come from from non-residents. So there's a there's a substantial a, a substantial benefit out of doing. Uh, a flat tax as well because you're reaching non-resident workers. Of course, we'd have to do an analysis on uh, out-of-state workers who, uh, you know, who do or don't pay uh, their own state income tax because we can't hit them with a double taxation issue. But it's still a significant amount of money when it's all said and done. Well, Michael, we we couldn't, we wouldn't be able to say if we have a worker that comes up from Oklahoma, we wouldn't be able to tax his Oklahoma-based income, but we would be able to tax his Alaska based income and Oklahoma would not be able to reach his Alaska based income if we're taxing it. Right. One of, one of the real oddities of income tax is if Alaska doesn't tax an Oklahoma work and I pick Oklahoma cuz it's got an income tax, if Alaska doesn't it doesn't tax the Alaska income of an of a Oklahoma worker, Oklahoma can tax it. And Oklahoma in fact is taxing it. Um, it's it, but but if Alaska taxed it, Oklahoma couldn't tax it twice. Right. Um, flat tax. Sharon, Representative Sharon Jackson's in the chat room. I got about two minutes here. Flat tax only hits working people. How would a consumption tax work? No, uh, flat ta- flat tax hits 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 everybody on an AGI. So, right. Uh, it it hits it hits investment income, um, uh, uh, passive income as well as uh, working income. Now now. Now, some people talk about only using a payroll tax. That's one of the problems with the Buckeye report, that it, it analyzes a flat. It says what's it calls a flat tax what's essentially a payroll tax. But a true flat tax taxes all income. It reaches both investment income as well as 
um, as well as uh, wages, and it would also reach the the lowest twenty percent because it would be a you would we would assess the tax on the PFD. Um, it would be a much smaller take of the PFD, but you'd assess the tax on a uh, uh, flat tax on uh, PFD income as well. So right. it is it, it it reaches all income. Well, then she goes on to say something that I couldn't agree with more. Bottom line, we need to quit spending before having this conversation. And I would agree, except for the fact that every other legislator seems to be having this conversation already. And if we don't participate in the conversation, we're going to get run over by that freight train. Less than a minute, Brad. Your final thoughts here. Well, yes, Representative Jackson's correct. It'd be great if we stopped spending. But but if she, if she looks around herself in Juneau, she sees a lot of votes for continued spending, both in the House and in the Senate. We have to face reality. They're not stopping spending. They're cutting the PFD. They're taxing the PFD. Now the question is, is there a better way than taxing the PFD? And the answer to that is yes. Budget, Brad, let's highlight number two here before we de- dive deep into it. Uh, we're in the weekly top three, which is our deep dive into the details. The Buckeye Institute report. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So in the in the ten year plan in the in the administration's ten year plan they highlighted an upcoming what what was then an upcoming report from a group called the Buckeye Institute which understandably understandably enough is out of Ohio and and talked about that as as giving some additional that, that report as giving some additional insight uh, the report's been delivered and it's hugely disappointing. Uh, and we can talk after the break why that disappointment. But but all of the buildup that the administration gave it was just was just uh, wasted uh, because the report itself really doesn't tell us what we need to know uh, about uh, about the situation that we find ourselves in. Which Harold in the chat room says that was really kind of a joke. It's not even a complete report. Uh, he says it's garbage. Brad seems to agree. Brad, some uh, deeper analysis on this. Well, in the in the in 2016. We had, well, 2016 and 2017, we had two really good reports about the impact of various revenue options on the Alaska economy. One was the ISA report from 2016 um, that, that delved into the impact of spending cuts and the impact of various revenue options. We talked about that in the last segment, but a, a very good detailed look at, at what impact uh, uh, various revenue options would have on the Alaska economy. In 2017, we had a report from a group called uh, the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy, um, ITEP, out of D.C., that, that does a lot of work on state uh, revenue measures. And ITEP did an excellent report on the, on the distributional effects, that is, the effect on the top 20 percent, middle 20 percent, lowest 20 percent, of the various revenue options, and they looked at things like PFD cuts and uh, income tax, progressive income taxes, and sales taxes, uh, and the impact that those would have, not as much on the uh, on the overall Alaska economy, which is what ICER had done, but the impact it would have by income bracket uh, on Alaska and Alaska families themselves. Excellent report. Uh, the Buckeye report, when when the administration started talking about the Buckeye report. I took it as an update of both the ICER report uh, from 2016 and the ITEP report from 2017. It would look at the impact of various taxes on the uh, of various revenue options on the Alaska economy, and it would look at the at the impact on Alaskans by of those of those revenue options on Alaskans by income bracket. And I thought it was going to be a, a, a an important addition uh, to the debate. Uh, uh, by by consolidating those two previous updating and consolidating those two previous reports, it does nothing nothing uh, along those lines, and uh, and really um, uh, really is a waste of effort, uh, if you will, of having gone through it. Basically, what the what it does is it looks at uh, progressive. It doesn't even look at PFD cuts. Doesn't even look at the impact of PFD cuts. Um, it looks at a progressive income tax. Uh, and, a, and 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 a sales tax, and and analyzes the imp and what it calls a flat tax, but which, which is really but what is really a uh, payroll tax, um, and looks at the impact uh, of those, relooks at the impact of those. ICER had already done it, uh, relooks at the impact of those uh, on on jobs and on the economy, and says it's bad. Well, yes, ICER already told us 
that, that any tax will have an adverse impact on the economy, but it's all relative. The question is what has the, if we're going down this road, what has the worst impact? Um, and, and, and the ISA report looked also at the impact of the jobs loss of the, of the lack of what the, what the lack of revenue would have on the economy. The Buckeye report doesn't do that. I mean, the Buckeye report says if you have a progressive income tax, you will lose uh, 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 some jobs and you will lose some income. If you have a sales tax, you will lose some jobs and some income. If you have a flat tax of the type they were looking at, payroll tax, you will lose some jobs and some income. Yep, we already knew that. The ISA right. report told us that. Right, right. This gives us nothing new, which, again, leads to your disappointment in this. All right, so number two is the disappointment of the Buckeye report telling us nothing new giving us information we already had. We needed more. We needed a deeper dive and I think a, a deeper analysis of the effect of PFD cuts, which, again, everybody except the governor and us seem to be ignoring. Um, so we'll keep a close eye on that. Um, and and I think that's that's where Alaskans are feeling it right now. I mean, we're feeling it. In the, We would have a PFD that could be upwards of $3,300, and now we're hearing numbers being floated of somewhere around 1200 maybe 1400 And that is just severely disappointing, and the effects on the economy would be profound. It's a tax. I mean, it's a tax, and it takes – it has a jobs impact, and it has an income impact. And the jobs impact is fairly easy. You just go back to the ISA report. You calculate the jobs jobs impact. You're taking nearly 10,000 jobs at a, at a $1.3 billion PFD cut, which is roughly what it takes to get you down to $1,200 to $1,000. At a $1.3 billion PFD cut, you're taking nearly 10,000 jobs uh, out of the economy. And you're taking a huge amount of income. You're taking uh, roughly – about two billion dollars by the, by the time you factor in the knock on effects, right? More than two more than two billion dollars out of out of the economy, uh, at, out of an economy that only has fifty two billion dollars in it in the first place. Uh, so you're really, I mean, you're really taking having huge impacts uh, uh, by these cuts, and 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 again, the legislature is, isn't analyzing that, and the Buckeye report doesn't analyze that. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Let's move on to number three. We made it all the way to number three today, which actually takes us from the state level to the national level. There's a new report out that Alaskans should be paying attention to, uh, particularly uh, baby boom generation Alaskans, as well as as early millennials, people who are moving into their uh, late 40s and early 50s. It's a report by the Social Security Administration um, talking about and, and talking about well, Social Security and, and Medicare trustees talking about where those programs are headed. And it's a it's a very disturbing report. Um, the Social Security the Social Security Trust Fund uh, is something that we've built up over time since the early 1980s. Built up over time to sort of sustain. Uh, the baby boom generation when the baby boom generation got gets to retirement and and come to find out we haven't been taxing ourselves enough we haven't put enough uh, into the um, into the trust fund to sustain uh, the baby boom generation and in fact uh, it is it the, the the trust fund is at a level that based upon uh, current projections of of how long baby boomers are going to last and and how much they're going to take from the system the trust fund's only going to last 16 years. We're, we're, we're the, the Social Security Administration now projects that we're going to run out of, run through the trust fund by 2035. What that means when you run through the trust fund is that there's not this savings account that helps cushion the blow of having this large baby boom generation go through uh, Social Security. Um, and, and it sort of falls back to whatever is being generated in payroll taxes by, uh, by then current workers. And it's not enough to take care of the, of the baby boomers. We, the, the, there's a need for the trust fund. There's a need for this additional savings account. Once the savings account runs out, um, in 16 years, then you're faced with it, with a huge problem. There's either a 20% shortfall in benefits. That is social security benefits will decline by 20% or, you need to start using general tax revenue uh, uh, from the income tax side uh, and supplement what's coming in from the payroll tax side um, in order to maintain full benefits. And what that does 
is just increase either increase the deficit uh, in the general fund in the general fund or it increases the the income tax obligation that that uh, that by then millennials and Gen Xers are going to have to pay. So it's a huge problem uh, uh, coming up on the horizon, and it's not limited just to security. Medicare uh, has the same problem. In fact, the Medicare trust fund, uh, the, the accumulated savings for Medicare, runs out in 2026. So we hit this problem with Medicare uh, before we hit it with Social Security. Both are big generational problems, essentially, in order for the baby boomers to continue to get the benefits uh, that many will say they've relied on getting once they get to retirement, you're going to have to increase taxes uh, on, on the people still working, basically millennials and Gen Xers, to pay for the benefits going to the baby boomers. And that's going to be a big problem as we move through the 2020s and into the 2030s. Well, and I think this is, I mean, this hits me personally simply because, I, I mean, I had to laugh that Social Security runs out of money the same year that I'm supposed to start taking it. And so I just saw this as yet another wake-up call to get my own fiscal house in order because it's not going to be there. I've paid into it my whole life, will have paid into it my entire working career, and I will have little to nothing when it comes down to it. They will start reducing those payments probably two or three years before they hit the insolvency mark. And even if I get something, it'll be a fraction of what it should have been, which is why we should be pulling out of these things and taking care of our own. This is what happens when you become dependent on government. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest. We're out of time for today, folks. Brad, thanks so much for coming on board and sharing with us. We can only hope that these things turn out okay in the legislature, and all we can do is keep fighting this battle. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.